so our readings today speak about uh, two kind of interesting and almost opposite topics. Um, one about the joy, you know, the Lord loves a cheerful giver, and then Jesus drops the bomb of, I tell you solemnly, unless a wheat grain falls on the ground and dies, it remains only a single grain. So how do we stick these together? Okay, uh, that's, the, that's the challenge in 10 minutes. So, uh, I remember when I went to college, there was this really good professor. He was a, a maths professor. And he had this incredible ability of teaching maths in a way that was just really, really practical. Because I remember doing graphs, you know, and, and, and curves or whatever it was. And I mean, I got the theory, I knew how it worked. So x squared x on a number equals zero, whatever it is, and you plot your graph. But I actually had no idea what they meant. I had no idea what that, what that was actually for. You know what I mean? I knew how it worked. It just made no sense to me. Uh, I didn't under, as in, I knew, I knew what to do. I just didn't understand it. So, but he explained how, how these things work and how it shows, you know, the different tendencies in nature or, or, or statistics, and he just translated it into something real. This is how we measure that. This is how we show that. And things just start, ah, and now that I understand that it, it makes a whole lot more sense. I've obviously forgotten since what it meant, but at the time it made a whole lot more sense. So that, that, and that was how he taught everything. So he, we weren't just like sitting down learning you know, this is how you do a, this is how you do logs. This is how you do, you know, sine, cos, tan, your angles. Uh, but he, he would show how it worked and where it came from and, and what it was what it was for. Maybe this is my head, what it's for, how it works. And it was just so it was stimulating, really, really interesting. He was a fantastic professor, really, really good. On the other hand, you might have teachers who uh, there are different teaching techniques. Other teachers who uh, who teach through embarrassment. You know, if, uh, when you get something wrong, stand up into the corner, you know, uh, write this out a hundred times. Uh, or teachers who are probably more, more common in, in universities where professors are just kind of so super smart, they haven't time for all of you plebs down there, all of you undergrads. Oh, how long must I tolerate you while I write my books? You know, and you get this kind of impression that they kind of walk in and they, just, they, 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 they want to train. They want to train behind them. And, uh, and there's, you know, okay, you may be famous, but you're really not a great professor. You know what I mean? I, I, I'm, I'm getting, you're not showing this truth to me uh, in a way that, that I actually want to engage in it, you know? Uh, then there are others who, who teach through fear. <laughs> you know what I mean? Where it's constant threats of the exams, constant threats of failing, right? So that there are different ways of teaching. But going back to that, 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 that first professor, when you see something lived, it, 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 means, it means a whole lot more. So he wasn't just teaching information that he had heard somewhere or read somewhere, but he was teaching maths that he understood and actually had a passion for, right? And that, that kind of came across. And then we all know the expression, actions speak louder than words. Actions speak louder than words. So when it comes to transmitting the faith, or transmitting isn't really a great word, it's more witnessing to the faith. Our actions will speak louder than our words. Our actions will speak louder than our words. And that's why it's so key, absolutely essential, that we do so with joy. Because if this faith that I have discovered in this relationship with Jesus, if it doesn't make me happy, if people don't see joy in me, well then, why would I want what you're proposing? You know what I mean? If all I see, so, so someone comes to you and, and they're, they've been practicing their faith since 1943, and they come to you and say, look, you have to pray the rosary. Jenny, if you don't pray the rosary, I swear now, I'd say, all going to hell. The other village over there, I'd say most of them are going to hell. And there's a fellow there died there during the week, and I'd say he's gone to hell too. Jenny never prayed the rosary, never went to mass. Never saw him inside a chapel. Japers, no. Japers, like, sure, I mean, like, the world's gone to rack and ruin. Japers, you have to pray the rosary. Do you know what I mean? If someone talks to you like that, you're like, Th thanks very much. Um, you pray away. Take care. Like, there's just no joy at all. And this might also have come from maybe the way we, well, the generation before me, how they grew up in school, where people, my parents' generation would often tell me, they got a slap for getting their prayers wrong at school. You know what I mean? They had to learn the act of contrition. They got it wrong and they got a slap. So they were, everything about like 
that their faith was do this or you get punished. Practice your faith or you get punished. Say your rosary or you get punished. Um, live a pure life or you go to hell. You know, so really, really not ideal, but it also shows why the generation afterwards didn't really continue it. Because if our faith is all about punishment and negativity, well then it, it, it's not attractive. Actions speak louder than words. If I see that your faith makes you joyful, if I see that your faith makes you happy, actually physically makes you smile, then that's, that's going to be far more powerful than, than any threat of three days darkness or, or hell or whatever else is coming. Uh, people need to see that, that our faith sets us free. They need to see it though. And that, the, the consoling thing about that as well, I was just talking to a, a seminarian recently and he said, he said Father Patrick, look, I'm, I just, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do the whole preaching thing. I just really don't, I don't know if I'm, if I'm, if I'm able to, you know, express myself so clearly. And I said to him, I said, but your teaching, teaching is, is definitely part of priesthood, but it's not those who are more eloquent who touch more hearts. It's those who love the Lord more who touch more hearts. It's those who love the Lord. If you know him, if you know his heart, even if you express it badly or insufficiently, people will see in you, he's got something. You know, he, he knows him. He knows the Lord. So don't worry about your eloquence or, or things like that. You bring your five loaves and two fish and let the Lord work the miracle. You bring what you have. Let, let the Lord do the rest. So, our, so joy... <coughs> Each one should give what he has decided in his own mind, not grudgingly or because he's made to or because he's afraid of hell. I added that bit. Just, uh, all right. For God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. <clears throat> and so like, the reason I say this also for, for St. Lawrence, uh, the, the story goes that the Caesar at the time, the Roman emperor at the time, uh, wanted the treasures of the church. He heard that this, this church was growing, got the Christianity as it was called at the time, uh, was, was growing, the Christian church was growing, so he wanted the treasures of the church. And so St. Lawrence, Deacon Lawrence, rounded up the poor <coughs> and said to the emperor, here are the treasures of the church. And for his insolence, he was condemned to death by burning. So he was uh, put into put over a fire, basically. And it's legend has it that at one point he said, I'm done on this side, you can turn me over. Uh, so this is where this, this, the, the, the idea of the reading as well, the Lord loves a cheerful giver comes from. That even with almost a certain amount of humor, he offers his life <clears throat> to the Lord. And so that's how then we can tie in this joy in giving, the joy in witnessing to the faith with, I tell you solemnly, unless a wheat grain falls, on the ground and dies, it remains only a single grain. But if it dies, it, reels, it yields a rich harvest. So that's how it works. We can still actually be joyful and giving. As in, we can joyfully give ourselves. <clears throat> we can joyfully offer ourselves. We can joyfully give our lives. And in St. Lawrence's case, we can joyfully die in martyrdom. <clears throat> but these things aren't opposites at all. And we live in an authentic relationship with the Lord, that, that, that joyful giving becomes part and parcel of who we are and what we do. So we pray today for all missionaries, and indeed all of us, who in some way are called to mission and to witness to our faith, that we may always do so with joy, never with fear, never with threats, never with uh, warnings or, 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 or fear of the, the, the oncoming uh, who knows, coronavirus, uh, vaccination, three days darkness, all of these, these things, again, I'm not going into the details of any one of them, but we shouldn't be motivated by fear. Motivated by love, motivated by confidence in the Lord. And that is where our joy will come from. Amen.